Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for um, indulging me to ramble for 45 minutes about laws and legislation. And even thank you for pretending to be interested in that. Very nice of you to be here. So before I start, um, I want to take a moment of expressing my gratitude towards the organizers of this awesome conference. Um, as a conference organizer myself, I actually was project lead for Open Social Conference 2015 in The Hague. I know how much blood, sweat and tears literally goes into this kind of thing. So first thing, I, if, if there is anyone from the organization here, then they will hear it. And if not, they will see it on video. Please give the organization of this conference a round of applause. And this also was a test to see if you are listening and awake. Thank you. So let's move on then. So who am I? Uh, my name is Hans de Waard. It's not Robin, sorry, that's a typo in my slides. Robin is a very good friend of mine. Um, and we do presentations together. So that's why his name turns up here. Uh, I'm Hans. I'm, uh, I've been working in IT and IT security for about 20 years uh, by now. So yes, I'm that old. Uh, my targets of my target areas of business are primarily um, heavily regulated environments like governments, um, medical and healthcare institutions, uh, the type of business that whenever something goes wrong, either someone is has to pay a lot of money uh, or someone, and this I find personally much more uh, scary. Uh, or someone who gets hurt, because especially in healthcare, uh, information, integrity, confidentiality, and availability is literally what is the difference between, what can be the difference between life and death. Um, but to keep the atmosphere a bit lighter than life and death, uh, I also do other stuff. I organize classical concerts. I have a classic Mercedes-Benz, and I grow my own wine grapes because everyone needs a hobby. But let's not ramble on too much about me. Why are we here? Why are we here in this room? Um, there is a paradigm change going on in uh, European law. We are moving from a construction where laws are typically descriptions of what you are not allowed to do towards models that outline uh, general guidances of uh, compliance and um, general uh, methodolog methodology to implement measures to mitigate risks. Um, where does that come from? Well, we are in an era of change. Our current times no longer um, allow for uh, lawmakers to be overly specific when it comes to certain technologies, when it comes to certain economic models, when it comes to, well, basically anything that was an unmovable truth almost 20 years ago, by now has become moving, and especially as the world somehow uh, appears to be bigger than Western or Eastern Europe, you need to implement laws and regulations that are not only uh, culturally applicable within a certain uh, continental realm, but can be used as a global universal type of methodology. So, um, but first, let's make sure that we talk about the same thing here, because I'm going to talk about cyber stuff. Um, so what is cyber? Well, cyber is literally nothing. Um, cyber is coming from the ancient Greek um, term, which means being able to basically control, push, or make something happen. So how does that relate to cyber crime, cyber sex, and uh, other types of cybers that we have nowadays? Hail to all the cybers, it doesn't mean anything. 
What it does mean, however, is that somehow a lot of people seem to think that it actually means something. So, um, because a lot of people think that it actually means something, I'm going to pretend that I am one of those people who actually think it means something, because else it would take me too much time to move out, get out all of those cyber references, um, and come up with another marketing term for this whole container uh, thingy. So where does this come from? Or at least where does the cybersecurity strategy that we now see uh, developing, where does that come from? Uh, a couple of things. First of all, laws and technologies don't necessarily complement each other. Um, just like, well, maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but open source software and economic business models they're also not entirely directly related. They tend to exist perfectly happy in each other's vicinity, yet being able to sell something that is free kind of like is a contradiction in terms. What you need to do when you want to sell something that is free is you have to focus on the circumstance around uh, that particular aspect. And then you have to come up with um, uh, methodologies and procedures and with value-added uh, regulations to ensure that the component that you are selling, even though it is free, becomes economically attractive from a different uh, perspective. And that is actually what the cybersecurity strategy is all about, because cybersecurity is a term, is a, a concept that is A, meaningless, B, undefinable, and C, well, is there even a C necessary? But what is valuable is information. What is valuable is the raw data. From the raw data, we create information by correlating raw data into entities, relations, and whatnot. From information, we create knowledge. And based on this knowledge, we take decisions as a society. Believe it or not, even politicians tend to think that they are influenced by actual knowledge. Um, and one of the things that I see um, happening nowadays is that um, although this is maybe hard to believe nowadays, laws actually go above technology. And yes, of course, there is technological uh, opportunity to keep certain information out of the realm of authorities, for instance, encrypted communication ensures that you are able to communicate with other people without governments intercepting your communication. Yet still, if a law in a country decides or at least defines that at some point in the judicial system, you should be able, or the government should be able to break into your systems, consequences be damned, well, that will happen. Luckily, we are in Europe, and Europe has, at least since about 75 years ago, a pretty good track record of um, keeping privacy or citizen privacy as one of its core competences. And I know when I'm saying that, I'm, and where I'm standing right now, 30 years ago, um, in this particular city, for instance, that type of liberty and that type of privacy was not yet taken for granted. So privacy and um, laws and technology are, well, let's say, interestingly, not entirely compatible concepts. Yet, what you see is nowadays, uh, I don't know who, who has seen Mark Zuckerberg uh, testify or promote himself uh, in front of the European Parliament recently. Who of you have seen that? A couple of people. Well, me too. Um, and so, so what, what I found interesting there is not necessarily 
uh, the whole marketing show and the whole circus that was put up around that. But what I found interesting is the actual fact that the European Parliament called him over to question him. Um, and what I also found interesting is the response of several of the parties in the European Parliament, um, as in that they have been profoundly dissatisfied with the level of answering that Zuckerberg provided, and that they will follow up. So that is interesting from a point of view that you now see uh, politicians not only taking an interest, but also seemingly taking responsibility to gain the knowledge needed to actually understand the concept and do something with it. Well, that's the same thing that's happening, or has been happening actually on a uh, cyber security uh, realm since about the early uh, 2000s, um, when we had the uh, first um, more or less globally accepted um, certification evaluation scheme for uh, IT uh, security related uh, audits and assessments, the common criteria, that was around 2000. That has been devised and updated in 2014. Um, and that's basically what we're going to talk about now. But still, what we see in the European Union, same as with the GDPR, uh, before the GDPR, countries regarded um, information security and information or privacy information security as being a national thing. Somehow with the premonition that the internet would stop at their borders and that parties wanting to exchange in international trade or international data sharing or exchange would gladly implement geofencing or whatnot to uh, do that. Well, that somehow magically didn't happen. Um, and especially companies like Google, or Facebook, or uh, the usual big suspects, uh, they, they, they're not going to. You have to approach this as a um, continent, I would say. Uh, and what we see nowadays is on the cybersecurity approaches, there is a very uh, nationally focused approach. So what will happen now is that the European Commission is drawing up a new regulation towards a harmonized model for information security, uh, cyber security, incident response, training, education, and whatnot. But what I find the most interesting goal and objective uh, in this is the one that I've outlined here, and especially the latter one, is it is the explicit goal of this regulation to ensure transparency of cybersecurity assurance. And assurance means being able to validate and evaluate if a uh, security measure or control has actually been implemented in any way that ensures its effectiveness. Because, well, um, assurance is without control, that's basically what the religious domain is all about, and that's, for instance, in the cybersecurity domain, stay out of the religious uh, domain. And the other thing, and this I mentioned briefly before, is we are going from a model where uh, laws dictate what is forbidden to a model where laws um, create a compliance realm or compliance domain in which as a company or individual you have done to perform uh, proper risk management and impact assessments to prove your compliance with that specific um, legal domain. Um, and I would say that this is a, an enormous plus because before we had uh, compliance with uh, IT security uh, laws was being placed under the legal departments <coughs> of companies. And, well, I, I mean, I, a lot of my friends are lawyers. Um, yes, they are. Um, uh, but their primary competence area doesn't necessarily lay in the IT realm. Their primary competence area is, is primary in the business of um, explaining no matter what is the reality, 
that they are somehow compliant to whatever alternative reality is being described by the law. Um, so what happens now, and that is the same thing with the, the GDPR, uh, for instance, is um, GDPR is not an IT law. GDPR is also not an, a legal or a compliance uh, department law. GDPR requires you to implement information governance information models. It requires you to come up with personal information registration administration with interface descriptions or whatnot. It actually requires you as a business to implement proper information architecture. So how does information architecture governance relate to legal compliance, or at least to the lawyer side of legal compliance? Well, doesn't because it just doesn't. So there are areas of business in which we've been doing this for quite some time, uh, especially in the healthcare realm. And um, when you look at um, medicine manufacturing, for instance, in the early 20th century, um, there were a lot of medicines uh, against the flu and against uh, pneumonia and essentially what these medicines did was not exactly cure the disease, but they made you die very happy because they were primarily made out of morphine and alcohol, which is awesome, which makes you really warm and fluffy but still die. So what happened in the early 20th century in the healthcare realm was that they implemented laws requiring um, uh, the, the so-called subsidiarity principle, which is uh, a, a legal construct which says whatever you claim to be effective towards something must actually be proven to be effective towards that something. So the medical industry went like, shit, now we actually have to come up with something that works. And that took them about 100 years, and then they started to implement uh, medical devices to help out, like pacemakers and insulin pumps and... Um, uh, artificial lungs and stuff, and well, with those instruments it also helps if they actually do what they're supposed to do and not necessarily uh, create cardiac arrests and whatnot. But now we have this new reality with the networked environment in healthcare, which also requires pacemakers to be, well, somewhat um, protected from, let's say, hacking, because well, what's more easy for an assassin? Do you think it's more easy to um, go into a bush or something like from a kilometer's distance and have a big giant sniper rifle and then hoping that with the wind and the angles and everything you're able to hit your target? Or does it look more easy to simply walk towards his house, have his Wi-Fi, overload his insulin pump and kill him like that? Personally, I would prefer the latter. But this implements, or at least this requires, the implementation of risk management, which means that you first have to know what the risks are of the product that you are trying to defend, then come up with requirements to mitigate those risks, then implement those requirements, and then actually test if those implemented requirements are indeed effective towards what you are trying to protect. So in the IT realm, this is something like the V model, there's different models, but this one is a very uh, common uh, part. So, like I said, data, uh, general data protection regulation uses the same principle. Know what you have on the information side, know whoever is using or processing the information, and if you know those things, it's very easy, at least it's more or less doable, to provide the data owner with the rights like access and portability or to demand erasure. And the nice thing about the GDPR as well, and this is, I mean, there's all, if you hear this, then the whole power to the people premonition of the GDPR, that might suggest that the GDPR is a anti-company law. But it isn't, because companies now for the first time in history, have one single go-to point regarding uh, information, the personal information security related stuff in the entire EU, instead of the 27 other 
pretty much disagreeing little parties which implemented their own version of this reality. Fan rod the UV rod out because now it's one less, but still the, the model is not very scalable. So what we're now coming up with in the EU cybersecurity realm is a EU-wide competence network. And the competence network's establishments uh, at first are creating a common uh, vocabulary. Um, because if you don't agree that you actually speak the same language, then it's very hard to even agree about anything else. And the same language doesn't necessarily mean the same linguistic language, like the spoken language, English or, or whatnot, but come up with definitions regarding scope, targets, measures, applicability, and whatnot. And this is something um, that's actually interesting because the, the individual uh, computer emergency response agencies within the member states, they used to all have a different definition of what is an IT incident. Um, an IT incident in the Netherlands, for instance, if you are aware that the Netherlands is basically this swampy area surrounded by water, which mainly uh, lays around three meters below sea level. Actually, my house in the Hague is four and a half meters below sea level. Um, in the Netherlands, a major IT incident would be not being able to reach the water level management facilities in my area. Yet, that type of IT-related incident might not be the same in, let's say, Austria in the Alps for reasons of not being underwater. So, first, we have to come up with a level of vocabulary. And then we have to up upgrade. I deliberately don't say update because we are taking a leap here. We need to upgrade security uh, in education. <laughs> the example given here uh, at PHP, a bit of crap, literally comes from an IT course uh, from a University of Applied Science in the Netherlands. Um, this is not unique for the Netherlands, and it, any of you who, who reads PHP will know instantly what's wrong with it, other than I've forgotten a couple of quotes here and there, but those are my typos. But the general principle is, let's say, input validation. So, um, in the past weeks, and this is really nice, uh, the, the national news agencies in the Netherlands have had over 15 major news items about uh, IT courses doing crap like this. Um, which, being an IT security teacher for several universities in the Netherlands, that makes my job security a lot better for now. But still, we have to update on this. So the focus for the next two years, which is coincidentally also the timeline for the implementation for the new EU Cybersecurity Act, will be to create at least some sense of security uh, in education as well. So we have building block number one, create a common vocabulary. Building block number two, make sure that we educate people to actually know what they're talking about. And even better, first we educate the teachers so that they are able to educate pupils to actually know what they're talking about. And then we go into certification. And um, the certification hooks into the concept of the whole transparency aspect. So how can you give people the tools to actually assess whether if the product that they are using is in some way fit for purpose, including uh, the security question? So you come up with certification, naturally. But certification has a pretty bad uh, reputation, especially if you look at um, commercial IT uh, certification realms, like certified secure by Norton Antivirus. This email is certified secure by Kaspersky, yet the Russian Secret Service is listening over your shoulder, but we don't tell anyone still. So what is, you, you first then have to come up with what your process of certification or evaluation towards certification would then be. Um, and luckily, the, the beauty about standards and norms is that you have so many to choose from. Um, we have the ISO 15408, 15408 which is uh, evaluation criteria for IT security, which happens to be the norm that basically the Western world around 2000 
adopted already as the common criteria, or actually the uh, 15408 is the norm which allows you to evaluate if some party has implemented those uh, common criteria correctly. And it is actually both a useful guide for developers as well for, as for customers. I'm sorry, I have a terrible cough, so I keep switching off and on my microphone to try and prevent you from being blasted away by uh, the coffin. So uh, if I at some point forget, please forgive me. So when you introduce a concept in law and then you say it's voluntary, that usually causes some kind of friction because voluntary laws, that kind of is a contradiction in terms. So what they've built in, uh, in this uh, particular realm, is that they have a comply or explain uh, principle, which means that you either adopt this norm, or you have to explain for every little teeny tiny detail which is in the bloody norm, and those are a lot of pages, why you don't comply, and thereby making it effectively easier to do comply to the norm than to explain why you don't. So I'm going to go over um, the um, items of the ISO 15408, but I should indicate also that this is a norm that is um, free to download, free as in beer although I wouldn't recommend reading the norm whilst drinking beer because it is quite a complex norm and you have like this, the, the Balmer optimum of intoxication versus information processing and that tends to go south quite easy. If you look at Windows Vista, we all know what that means. Um, so I will go over the norm, but you are able to download it yourself from the ISO website and uh, it is, uh, if you're used to reading um, technical requirements, specification documentation, it's a surprisingly readable and practical norm. It's big, it is a couple of hundred pages, uh, A4 size uh, 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 information, but that is not because it's so complex, it's just because it's, it covers an immense amount of topics. Uh, so I will scan the surface here so that you at least have some clue as to the scope and coverage of this norm. Uh, but I would highly recommend you to download at least part one, which is the general uh, model and introduction, uh, and that gives you the impression of the scope and the idea in which this norm is applicable. Um, because again, this will be a voluntary law soon. Um, yeah, so if you want to be able to market any kind of IT-related system or IoT-related system in any kind of regulated environment, that whole concept of voluntary may not be entirely applicable. So, we have this concept called target of evaluation. That's the beginning. And the target of evaluation is not necessarily a single system. It is what we, in uh, the architecture domain, uh, referred to as an information domain. And an information domain is one or more systems or applications or parts of systems or applications that work with certain related information entities and are being used in a certain type of functionality. For instance, HR departments, if you would consider uh, the HR process to be the target of evaluation that would consist of both the HR registration with the names and addresses and dates of birth and whatnot. It would also include the financial processing information because for some reason employees want to be paid. So if at least they don't work for free or voluntary and you have a financial administration, you should consider that under the information domain, HR. So I hope that's clear. Information domain does not mean single application. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but this makes the concept a bit hard from a vendor perspective. I would even say almost impossible from a vendor perspective to claim that your application 
single application is always compliant to uh, common criteria or ISO 15408. Because from my point of view, and I will give an example later on, um, the only type of application that's actually, or system that's actually suitable to be an information domain by itself is an operating system. Because that is a low level, single purpose, mostly type of thing to ensure that it serves other things. And um, we'll go into that later, but for instance, SUSE Linux, SUSE uh, Linux Enterprise Server has been certified by the Bundesamt für Sicherheit and Informationstechnik, which is the German NSA. Um, SUSE Linux Enterprise Server has been certified for ISO 15408 uh, purpose as being a uh, target of evaluation by itself. So this is a concept you should just internalize and I've copied the list of whatever type of thing might be considered to be uh, a target of evaluation and a target of evaluation can also be a process. So targets of evaluation um, are also combinations of different um, assets, and assets can be systems, documentation, um, personnel even. And especially IT systems, as they are configurable, they might in some configurations not be um, suitable for usage in such a high, uh, highly regulated environment. If you don't implement proper security controls like SA Linux or AppArmor or to name just a couple of simple things, uh, then it might be that that particular configuration is not applicable to be a target of evaluation. But still, just accept this as being reality. So the target audiences for the 15408 are consumers, because consumers can define requirements, what they would need from a security perspective uh, in a target of evaluation or a system. And that's called a protection profile. So a protection profile could be, I have a firewall and that should prevent stuff from going in and out of my network without me explicitly telling anyone to do so. Developers, on the other hand, they develop the security target, which is supposed to be protected by the protection profile. So system target, or security target, the system, protection profile, the requirements of anything you want to impose on that system. And then you have the evaluators, which have the fun job of poking around to see if the protection profile is actually sufficient for uh, the target, and then you have the rest of the world. So part one, uh, like I said, is actually quite readable. It goes over how to uh, come up with security re requirements, so uh, the, the process of uh, requirements, uh, elicitation, specification, validation, uh, how to create protection profiles and packages of profiles, because you can reuse profiles across um, different targets of evaluation which have the same profile. I mean, if you create a profile for a firewall A, then you can probably re reuse that profile for firewall B, and that's entirely legitimate. And nine, uh, chapter nine, or clause nine in ISO terminology, uh, is on how to, uh, uh, how to handle evaluation results. And then we have a couple of annexes which go into detail uh, of what it is. So chapter seven, how to come up with requirements, how to define them, how to uh, create a terminology and use the uh, terms appropriately for uh, the requirements. Chapter eight, come up with profiles and packages. And here again, the, the example of the firewall. For instance, I have an IP tables firewall and that should do whatever every other firewall do, should do as well. So then I have a protection profile for a firewall and the security target in this instance will be the IP tables firewall. And then uh, we have the evaluated results and the nice thing about that is uh, the purpose of the common criteria is not only to evaluate but also to communicate those results. 
So, for instance, the um, SUSE uh, validation, SUSE Linux Enterprise uh, Server validation, that is the result of that, the report is online in its entirety. So you can access the report and see how SUSE prepared itself for this certification process. You can also see uh, which parts they included in it and which parts they didn't. So the scope um, of part one is mainly background information. Part two is towards what kind of requirements do we have? And part three is what kind of assurances can we implement so that the requirements are met? So then you look at assets and environments. And anyone who's familiar with IT security, uh, especially the ISO 27001, uh, will have heard about the concept of assets and environment, because an asset is something you want to protect, the environment is some, somewhere you want to protect the asset in, and then you create a risk profile of all the risks that the asset might um, be exposed to within the environment. And assets can be everything, even I can be an asset if I want to be. As, actually, for my own company, I am an asset. The rest of the world might think differently, by the way. That's their freedom. Um, so, if you go into concept and relationship, an owner wants to protect assets, will take countermeasures to mitigate risks, a threat agent will try to impose those risks on the same assets, and that's how it all ties together. So, the whole idea of the ISO 15408 is uh, to de demonstrate uh, applicability, appropriateness, subsidiarity, if you will, effectiveness, uh, to define the fitness, or to de demonstrate the fitness for purpose of the measures that you take on security. So, because if something is not interesting for you to consider to be a risk, then you don't have to do anything against it. Uh, so the whole process of, of risk assessment is not just coming up with as many hypothetical scenarios as possible uh, in which something can go wrong. No, it must be so in some way related to any reality that you feel yourself into. So evaluation gives you confidence that the countermeasures that you take are sufficient, are correct, to mitigate the risk that is exposing your assets. So then we have part two. Uh, which goes into the functional components and the requirements. Uh, again, I've just outlined the basic uh, steps or the basic uh, um, concepts here. Um, coming up with requirements towards a security target, creating a protection profile, and it will create what's called security functional requirements. If you are an IT architecture student or IT student in general, developer, then you will note that security requirements are mostly regarded as being non-functional uh, requirements. For instance, the IEE norm of uh, software requirements specification explicitly names security requirements to be non-functional requirements. So what does the ISO 15408 mean here? They mean that security functional requirements are Basically, the security access and authorization and authentication measures built into a system or into a target of evaluation. So not necessarily the security requirements on the physical environment or the operational environment of, let's say, a system administrator. Like, I have to keep my uh, copies of the installation media absolutely secret because else someone else will steal them. It means that this is whatever you can configure inside a system as being a security measure. And that means usually uh, authorizations. So then you can come up with a policy. And the policy is the part where you link uh, the requirements to the actual procedure in which the system is used. And then you combine them into uh, target of evaluation security functionality, which is the matrix in which they tie it together. So the object of relevance here are usually uh, users. Users want to access information. That information is being 
categorized in objects. A user has a session in which it will interact with the system. And <clears throat> to facilitate that, system, uh, that session, there will be resources available, like a server, a network, or whatnot, to uh, facilitate that. And then, um, within those concepts, you will have certain attributes. For instance, this user has this profile, this security clearance, so therefore they, will may, have, they may have this role in the system, etc. This basically sounds like a simple explanation of role-based access control uh, outlining, because it's even not that much more. And this model defines a distinction between um, security functionality data, which is that side, um, which consists of the user attributes, which consists of access control uh, and uh, information attributes, and user data, which basically is the, um, the data of the system itself, so the workflow processing uh, data. So security-related data is metadata, and the rest is uh, system data. So part two has the following uh, chapters, which requirements should be imposed on security audits? What can we audit on communications? Does cryptography uh, play a role in there? How do we protect the actual data of the system? Um, how do we go about identification and authentication, uh, multiple factor uh, authentication, for instance? What is our security management scheme? How do we go about privacy, et cetera, et cetera? And then we have part three which first we created all the requirements, the, the security requirements, and part three of the norm goes into how can we then come up with assurances that provide the required level of certainty that we need. And, well, you have to think in vulnerability management because the thing that you are trying to prevent are vulnerabilities from being exploited, and vulnerabilities can come from a number of sources, i.e. the requirements of a system have been so poorly described that the business process will not be able to be facilitated. That is a vulnerability. Development is performed poorly, or the operations of a system are not implemented correctly and therefore leaving open all kinds of security holes. Vulnerability management you can do on a certain uh, on certain levels, you can either eliminate the vulnerability, minimize the impact of the vulnerability, or monitor the uh, vulnerability occurring so that you can then take action. Oh, by the way, I'm going through this quite fast, but the slides will be online if anyone is interested. And then how do you go about uh, approaching evaluation? Well, you can simply analyze a process and procedure you can do penetration testing, you can uh, implement planning and control cycles to come up with this, and then you determine what kind of uh, assurance level that you need to adhere to from a certain system. For instance, if you implement a healthcare-related system, from start to finish, you need to know what's going on there. So you will need to come up with assurance requirements describing in detail all the different parts of the system. And you have to choose a level that is appropriate for the uh, target of evaluation that you want to protect. Uh, and in the last part, for instance, let's say functionally tested means I have my senior user group walking through all the procedures as soon as I have a new release. Structurally tested means I add automated testing Method, uh, method, methodically tested and checked okay, uh, is uh, a formal process in which uh, tests are being validated, etc., etc. In the norm, there are several of these matrices going into this. I'm wrapping up due to time. Um, this is the chapters and the clauses which are outlined in part three, which gives you input for that, and as open source, uh, community, I think we should start preparing for this because this will be what will be required from users that want to use our systems in the nearby future. So we should think about coming up 
with um, protection packages and uh, protection profiles and maybe standardized uh, community efforts to create such uh, profiles. Because just as the GDPR, free and open source software, are not developed in a vacuum. They are developed in a virtualized environment, but still they are... Um, we need to be law-abiding citizens. So communities, we need to start because we can also benefit from this. Because being open source, being transparent, means that we, as part of our ecosystem, can actually be completely and brutally honest about what we do. And this is a big plus for businesses that are actually be able to contribute back to us by means of those uh, validation packages, just like the end user now helps us with documentation and testing uh, and whatnot. So, if you have time, look into the use case of SUSE. It's uh, on the website of SUSE. Uh, they have a nice report of everything they've done to ascertain the certification. And basically, this is what we should do better, as I just outlined. And I want to end with a very happy picture, because it is a very happy ending, I would say. And I'm even somewhat on time. So, who is still awake? Sweet. Uh, I'm not sure if I have time for questions, or if you're even still able to formulate some questions. Yes? Who dares? I will take this as a sign that I have been absolutely clear on this topic and that you have been sufficiently informed. <coughs> so thank you very much for your um, presence and awareness here. And uh, I uh, look forward to uh, having some beers with you because that is actually my next purposeful goal for today. All right, enjoy. <laughs> <laughs>